For centuries, uh, you know, if you look at agriculture, I was always wondering why is it that in the last 60 years or so, uh, after the Second World War, the world uh, agriculture has gone topsy-turvy. You know, why is it that we somehow believe that, you know, our lands were not productive enough to give food to our people and so on. So therefore, we went in what is called as the intensive farming systems and we know what we have done to our agriculture. Just to give an example, look at when Norman Borlaug, uh, uh, the Nobel laureate, who passed away recently, he used to tell me very often that, you know, if India, a country like India, had not gone in for green revolution, the country would have required 58 million hectares more land to produce the food that it is producing today. Well, he's right. I don't, uh, I don't challenge that. But uh, if uh, India had not gone into green revolution, I think we would have been a much safer place to do farming. Because today, if you look at it, after 40 years of green revolution in India, 120 million hectares are faced with various levels of degradation as far as soil is concerned, which means uh, double the uh, uh, area of land actually uh, which he wanted to save has now been devastated or is faced with degradation. Now, uh, the, the lesson that we need to draw is, is that the way forward because this has created what is called as a terrible agrarian crisis in India as a result of which the natural resource base on which farming is done is destroyed and that is the reason why in India farmers are committing suicide. In the last 15-17 years, we have had 200,000 farmers committing suicide. And this is not because they are indebted or they are loaded with credit and so on. It's because the entire equation goes wrong when the natural foundation or the natural resource base is destroyed. And I think that is one thing which is very obvious. If the world had gone in to natural farming systems to uh, bring in a sustainable farming model, I am sure, first of all, there is no drop in the yield. Let me make it very clear. This impression that the companies and the agriculture scientists give is that, you know, uh, oh my God, you know, organic farming systems are very good, natural farming systems are very good, but, you know, if you have to produce or feed the world, then there is no food. Uh, you know, this, these lands can't produce food. Let me first correct you. Uh, we have 6.7 billion people on earth today. The food that we produce is good enough for 11.5 billion people. There is no dearth of food in the world. It is only the distribution of the political problem of carrying that food that is creating this inequality. One part of the world eats more, the other part is left to starve. Now, this is one crisis, which means, you know, from the conditions that we have today, and uh, now there are ample studies to establish that there is no drop in productivity if you go in for natural farming systems or you go, go in for intensive farming system. But in the long run, intensive farming system more, does more damage, where natural farming system means for my future generations and for their future generation, they can uh, hope to produce food from that given piece of land. But the way we are going forward, I wonder and I dread that at least next 20, 30 years, we won't be able to produce food from our lands. They have become, they have been so contaminated and they would, uh, their fertility has been destroyed beyond, beyond reversible levels. But lately there has been a remarkable model in India. And this model exists in the state of Andhra Pradesh. In Andhra Pradesh, 12 districts are, are, are continuing with something called as non-pesticide management of agriculture, which means they do not apply chemical pesticides at all. And they also do not grow genetically modified crops. And they are growing all kinds of crops. Yes, we are still using nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, but I'm sure that, you know, the first step has been taken. So gradually we will phase out the chemical fertilizers also. But the message here is very interesting. Uh, Till last year, 2008, the area it occupied was about 100,000 acres. This year, you will be surprised, 2009, it has grown to 1,300,000 acres. Now, 1,300,000 acres is not a small piece of land. And what has happened is there is no drop in the productivity. The, the health of the people has improved because the pesticides do not harm them. And then, you know, the many of the, uh, the entire economics has improved because the, the, the pesticide companies were pumping out money from the villages into their own coffers. Now, that has uh, been stopped. As a result of it, you will be surprised, the insects have also disappeared. So, which means when, when you apply these uh, chemical pesticides the way we do, the insect uh, regeneration takes place. But because we have stopped using pesticides, we've gone for biological means and so on, there's a less incidence of pest attack. Now, if this can happen, 
happen in 1300,000 acres in India and they, they are, and it is happening without the government support, it is interesting. And if this can happen, I think this model can be replicated all over the country. But believe me, nobody wants to do it because agriculture scientists as well as the governments, they expect a kickback. And if you have nothing to sell, you have nothing to be you know, uh, shared by, by the scientists as well as by the, by the policy makers. So I think uh, if you have a technology where you have something to sell, everybody wants to promote it. But when there is nothing to sell, that technology is not at all accepted uh, by, by the main line. And I think this is the biggest uh, obstacle that we find in the promotion of sustainable farming systems all over the world. But yes, we have examples, not only in India, but in several of the developing countries. And we need to really build on them, scale them up. And I think we have the answer to the crisis that the world faces today.